I do that every time. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Doc Talks, where I, Doc, listen, I mean, talk. Man, we're off to a good start. Just kidding. Had a wonderful stream last night for Red Again, if you haven't caught it, right here on NerdWorks. It's amazing. It's a lot of fun. Had a great story. Loved everybody who showed up. It was awesome. I fixed the echo. Calm. Peace. One with the universe. Did I fix the echo? Do you guys still hear an echo? Tell me, 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 tell me. I foxed it. Okay. Sweet. We're going to continue on with feats. I'm going to try to make this a little bit more interesting. I, I listened to the last one and I was not happy with it. Mostly because feats are kind of exciting. They're just one of those interesting things that are put in there. Feats are, again, like I was talking about last week, feats are these things that you could do when you can take an ability score jump in D&D or if you take a variant at the very beginning. I encourage you to only take them when you're trying to roleplay something in your character. We left off with Healer last week, and it was really cool. Mike was talking about it, and with me about you know the rogue and using your bonus action to use something so you could do a bunch of stuff and heal a little bit you could use that in dynamics and min max building uh if you don't have a healer in your group which if you're min max you probably do have a healer and a designated tank and all that other fun stuff but if you don't or you want the healer to have a little bit more fun and not worry about spell slots for healing it's a way to go I know, as I say, it was going to be a little less boring, but the first one that we got here is Heavily. So I'm going to combine some of them. Lightly, yeah, it's Lightly, Moderately, and Heavily Armored is a feat you could take. The prerequisite to all three of these is the one before it you need. So Lightly, you don't need any prerequisites. You don't need anything to take it. You could just take it. And what it does is it gives you proficiency in wearing light armor. There's some debate about this. I've heard people argue a lot about armored wearing casters. If you hear this argument, it kind of is valid. If you talk to people who have listened to the mythos and the story of D&D &D throughout the years. Which is this idea that a caster couldn't have armor on. Like it stopped the somatic components you needed to be free to cast. It was also a balance in the system. Cancer, or casters, not cancers. Well, cancers too. Do heavy damage. The offset is that they were easy to hit. And it's just a give and take ratio. Nothing major about that. So in these three, that's what happens. One of the things that happens is, is heavily armored. You can increase your score by one. Uh, your strength score by one. And moderately and lightly armored, you get to choose your strength or deck score. There's a reason for that. And that's because it's going to come into the the ones where they go into the Masters. And we're going to start off with the Heavy Armor Master after that. You need to be proficient in Heavy Armor. Whether you took the feat to get there or your class race allows you to wear Heavy Armor, it doesn't matter. As long as you can wear Heavy Armor, you could take this feat. It is kind of cool. So, obviously... Any one of these where you can take an ability score raise is worth it. You're exchanging one ability score, then not both, to gain something. The, the thought process is that the more you get from it, what you're doing is you're exchanging ability for the one score. In a lot of cases, it's not going to make sense. Min-maxers usually don't take a lot of feats. And, and again, remember when I talk about min-maxers, I'm not shooting them down. I'm just trying to put my brain into where they are. 
they they don't take a lot of feats to like get these proficiencies or unless they have a thought process behind it a lot of theirs are going to take are trying to be bulkier harder to hit maximizing the character that they have again min max is that's not an issue i can play at that table but i really prefer the rp and so when i think about taking one of these armored feats i think it's because of one of these other things again i'm going to increase my strength by one but while I'm wearing heavy armor, bludging, piercing, and slashing damage that are taken from non-magical weapons. Remember, I'm in heavy armor now. In most cases, my armor is going to be about an 18 uh, at max at the plate. Um, and I love when people say plate mail. Uh, just a side note, plate mail doesn't exist. Plate does, though. <laughs> Um, it reduces by three. This reminds me of the old damage reduction days. Some of you guys that played D and D in the past will understand when we talk about D R S R spell resistance or damage reduction. It was by like one, two, or three. This is three. So if somebody hits me with a non magical weapon and does slashing, uh, piercing, or bludgeoning damage, I'm just going to subtract three when I take that damage. Interesting enough, I have to be wearing the armor. So I know what some of you are thinking because I've heard people talk about it before, which is crossing this over with like a, a barbarian. And a lot of barbarians can get a higher armor class by not wearing armor. So it's just one of those little things to think about. Heavy armor masters kind of neat when it comes to role playing because you're using your armor to deflect some of the damage. So remember what I told you before? I'm one of those people from one to ten. Uh, you just miss me when if if you roll a one to ten and it misses, you missed. It's just bad aim. Ten to whatever my deck score is, I got out of the way. You were supposed to hit me, but I was nimble enough to get out of the way from the my deck score up. Now we're talking about my armor class. Hey Kenobi, and my armor is doing that whatever that offset is for example leather armor is 11 plus your decks right that's how you get that let's say it's three so let's just say i'm 14 ac again one to ten doesn't change or one to nine one to nine you miss me straight up miss me 10 and 11 you hit my armor but it deflects off 12 13 misses that's m me and my dexterity and that's how i would use that in that order or change it around it doesn't matter the next one in here is Expiring Leader. I talked about in character builds that charisma should never be a dump stat unless you want a non-charismatic character. You want somebody who doesn't talk, intimidate, doesn't care about those things, not trying to influence or change or even get along with people. Charisma is a fine stat to dump, but I don't suggest it. But if your charisma is 13 or higher... And if you wonder about some of these prerequisites, it's because 13 is a plus one. And they just kind of set it to that. It was kind of a thought process on theirs. Um, this one, you actually have to take 10 minutes. So before a battle, a big battle, you can give a speech. Great role-playing moment. Uh, different DMs do it different ways, but... The role play moment would still be there. Sometimes the dice decide if you're going to give a good or bad speech. Or, in this instance, you just give the speech. And the neat part is the speech. It says that you choose six creatures. So all you need to do is talk to six people. That's a big party. Just, I'm not going to lie. That means there's seven of you rolling around killing things. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and those people gain temporary hit points. Again, there's restrictions to this. You can't take temporary hit points if you have temporary hit points, etc., etc. It's a neat little function. Like, you can be the pep talk, the hype king or queen of your group, and use this. If you find yourself doing that, take this. It gets something from your role play is basically what this is doing. Keen Mind is one of those that I always have an issue with. And I'll be honest with you. I like the way that Matt Mercer handled this with Liam in the new campaign in, in, in Season 2 of Critical Role. And like it or hate it, it you could take stuff from any DM. Um, basically, 
you in, increase your intelligence score by one. Again, all these usually say that you can't go above 20. We'll hit the ones where you can or it helps you go above. But those are usually magic items. It says you always know which way is north. Irritates me because if you're traveling in a cave, how do you know which way north is? And how Matt Mercer handled that was very simple. If you could see... And use the things around you, you absolutely can see which way north is. But if your vision's obstructed, you're in the middle of a blizzard, stuff like that, you don't know. I, as a DM, love that. But I'm also one of those people, as a player, I like to have restrictions like that put on me. The ones that make sense. Because it makes sense. Um, you can always know the number of hours left before the next sunrise or sunset again. If you can't see, you don't know. I like that. Um, you can accurately recall anything you've seen or heard in the past month. I actually like this one. In the last 30 days, anything that your character knows, they know. I wish more DMs would play like the Keen Mind feat with some of their players. We have games that play weekly. I'm in some games that are bi-weekly. My player, my character, has not experienced time like I have. But in a week or two, I might have forgot something. I shouldn't be expected to roll for something that I clearly heard within a time frame of not having short-term memory loss. Just because the game took longer doesn't mean that, you know, we play a game for three years and it might cover a span of a month or two in a game. I shouldn't be hurt for that. And I kind of like that Keen Mind does that automatically. It's an amazing thing. But if you're a DM, you don't need to be mean to your players. You need to encourage your players to separate what they know from what their characters know. Mike and I talk about that a lot. Me and a lot of my DM friends talk about that. And by encouraging, what I mean is, yeah, you don't know that, but... Or my player would know something and wouldn't have done that action knowing these are fine retcon is perfectly acceptable within the game <laughs> you can take back something when you know that your character would have known and if you can make the dm understand that then you're good these are important aspects of the game and again, remember, we're trying to create an environment that is not toxic, that everybody's having fun in, and we want people to have fun. Keen Mind has its things, but again, it's one of those that I do encourage the DM or storyteller, whatever they want to call themselves, I prefer storyteller, but to look at their table and, and work with their players on stuff. I don't discourage it. I kind of like that you increase your intelligence as a, as the ability score. And then the other part of it is like, you just have a really sharp mind. I'm not saying I wouldn't want to play a character, a character like that. I, I think it would be an awesome character to have, but I wouldn't be playing the game to be like, what time is it doc or, or DM? Like exactly what time we're dms we're making stuff up on the fly if i tell you in the evening you know it's the evening you know how many hours are left all that other stuff if you have a game where your characters are more concerned at how many hours are left in your rests you're probably being too strict on resting rules make sure that your group is good with that <clears throat> we covered lightly armor so i'm gonna skip that and we're gonna go to linguist i actually like this one a lot too Increasing intelligence by one again. Not going over 20. Love it. Uh, you learn three more languages of your choice. You want to take this feat at my table? I encourage it. But you better be studying languages the whole time. Your idea is not to take the three languages once you take this. Your idea is building up to this. You're studying these three languages. You're getting close to being proficient. And I would love to use that as a role play where you come across the language that you're learning. You can kind of pick up on most of it. We might make a few roles, but it'll make it really fun. I do like campaigns with language barriers as well, as uh, Gorth was saying in the chat. 100%. 
A hundred percent. I have played a character who only spoke Undercommon and Goblin, and it was a lot of fun with the party. We use sign language a lot, and that's when I learned that trying to communicate without talking with somebody literally already is in the rules. It's an intelligence role, and it was a lot of fun. The other cool part about this is the creation and being able to break ciphers, the DCs. You know, it's all in there and how to do it, but it's a really neat thing that you're writing down that you as a DM could use if one of your players takes this, which is you steal it, the book, and then you have to try to decipher it and there's a DC set for it or they steal a book and it's ciphered and now they have to. It's kind of an interesting thing. Lucky is one of those feats. I don't let people take Lucky. I don't like it. I talk to people who want to play Halflings about the re-rolling the ones. The Halfling one I don't like is because it's unlimited and I really dislike it altogether. But Lucky is one of those where you can expend a point. I can see this if that's your character's MO. If you're always rolling the dice trying to go on luck. But remember that luck goes both ways. And so <laughs> this says that it, you know you can spend a luck point to re-roll. You can read it. I'm not going to get into technicalities. But here's the caveat. I might let somebody take this, but I want them to know that I've got three points as a DM throughout the game. That if they roll a d20, I can make them roll it again as well. Because luck goes both ways. I do understand why this is in here. And I understand why it's part of the halfling thing. If you guys remember the old kinder class, it was a lot of fun. It really was. It had a lot of story elements that did it. Uh, back then, you really needed to min-max or you're going to die anyway. But you could really use it in the story aspect of re-rolling ones and like having miraculous saves. And really interesting story stuff as well um luck is just one of those interesting things and as guar said it there is you could vary into luck stat as well um and make the game just that much more interesting a couple of these including the next one that we're going to talk about are feats that are set up and i really want you to think about this um if you're making a character who wants to hunt down casters mage slayer is the one you want so using melee and cat in, in combat, usually you don't have a lot of stuff against casters. It's your saves, or they try to hit you. You know they've changed the AC, so it's not Thaco anymore, which it has its pros and cons. And I will admit it has a lot more pros, but I'm not willing to say that it was terrible. I actually liked it a little bit. It just took a lot more prep and math. <clears throat> so, but basically, when a creature within five feet of you casts a spell you can actually use your reaction to attack that character or that creature, excuse me. When you damage a creature that's concentrating on a spell, that creature has disadvantage. Again, because you've mastered techniques in fighting casters. I really like it. Um, and then you have an advantage on saving throws with spells. And I want to be clear, that's the one I love. <laughs> that's the one I love a lot. Advantage on saving throws against spells by creatures that are within five feet of you is a really neat aspect. I do want to apologize because I realized I didn't change my thing to say episode six, but I think you guys get the thing. And Mike, yes, I understand that people don't like Thaco and people had a lot of problems with Thaco. But when you grew up with it, you kind of understood that for me to hit you with a spell is different than me hitting you with a sword. Than me hitting you with a blunt object, etc., etc. Thaco had that property about it. Spells had a different DC than melee had, than arrows had. And it, in realistic battle play, and I, I do do the quotes because I realize that D&D is a world where you take a little spark, you throw it, it lands, it sparks for a little bit, and then an explosion happens and you cast Fireball. I get that. But it was uh, it was an interesting aspect. And I, I enjoyed it. I know other GMs and DMs that did. I get why people don't like it, but I enjoyed Thaco because for me to hit somebody as a caster was different than the Barbarian trying to hit somebody. 
And it just added a different aspect of it. Magic Initiate. There's no thing in this that says that you can't take it as a different class. So, yes, there is a Eldritch Knight. Yes, there is the... And I, I don't know why this is failing me now, but the the rogue magic user, the trickster, is in there. But this also allows you to learn spells. Not a lot. Arcane trickster, thank you. It it's not a lot. It's a but it is something interesting. It just like gives you that little tidbit. Um you learn two cantrips from a class. And cantrips are a lot of fun for role playing. Mike can tell you last night he used the cantrip he didn't have, but will just adjust his character sheet because I like that he used it like that. And you could use your cantrips for a lot of stuff. You can use them for story stuff. You can use them. I am a, a storyteller. I encourage my players and I reward my players for not fighting. In my worlds, there's not a black and white good and evil. There is... <laughs> we should talk about that because I like message too. There is a... The uh, Magneto bad guy. In X-Men comic books, Magneto wasn't bad. He just had different ideas. And even he ended up switching sides. And, and the one thing about that X-Men comic book was how flip-flop realistic emotion was. And that's why people enjoyed it. But just because somebody's evil in your idea doesn't mean it's evil. And I'm going to use our new Red Again podcast as an example. Some of the people in Remed Again in, in the human kingdom or the, the now just open kingdom that wasn't segregated are really scared that the elves are going to attack again. And a lot of people don't know why. And that's because a lot of people really don't know that history of what happened before the downfall before 11,000 years ago. Nobody remembers. And even though that event closed the gate in my mind, there was still this war. There was still this fear. I don't know why I brought that up, but here we are on a tangent. I'm going to come back. Uh, magic Initiate's cool. Because you could have innate magical abilities and not be a magical person. And it might have something to do with more of what your character's like or maybe your parents. Maybe you take Bard with this because you have to choose which class. Or Druid. And one of your parents is a Druid or a Bard. This would be a perfect thing to throw in there as... A rule instead of ability score to be more like your parents because just to have a good hero doesn't mean your parents have to die even though sad boys probably do the martial adept is another great one and now we're getting into some where you notice that you're not getting ability scores because you're getting something bigger out of it spells is bigger I'm not gonna lie let's just be honest with it spells is huge hi Wednesday Uh, but Martial Adept allows you to do martial training and gives you special combat maneuvers. I love it. DMs, look into this if your player takes this. Have a little bit of fun with it. But basically, you learn two maneuvers of your choice from Battlemaster Archetype in the Fighter class. Why would you want that? Well, uh, two's not bad. Battlemasters are pretty awesome as they get going, but... It's one of those abilities that, how to say this, it's not that fighters get better just because they get better as they go up. And this might be the 2E talking to me, where you used to have to find somebody to train you to get to the next level, even after you got your experience points. But basically, you can do that. You can get a superiority die. Some of the cool little things as a fighter that you can transfer over to anybody in martial weapons. Or even if you want to put a little flavor into your warlock wizard, somebody who doesn't normally use weapons, um, 
If you have more of a Gandalf idea in your head of a wizard, you could add this. Gandalf could fight with a sword. He fought well with a sword. You can put these on there. Uh, we're going to skip medium armor master because it's a lot like the other one. Basically, it increases uh, your AC as long as you have a dex that's higher. Um, I I'll go over this because it is enough different. I'm sorry. Fighter wizard. Exactly. But not like taking fighter classes. You don't have to multi-class for this. Multi-class has its downfall as well, depending on what your DM, GM, or storyteller does. This is just norm. The rules is written, makes it, it makes it balanced for that, but you're losing a lot by taking a level in something else. Where, like, if you just want the ability to be proficient with a martial weapon, this would be perfect. Medium armor master. Now, remember, we had the negative three... To the damage rolls wearing heavy armor with the heavy armor master medium armor master um wearing medium armor doesn't oppose disadvantage on your stealth checks this is perfect if you're wanting to go up as a rogue maybe to get into a little bit more medium armor but you don't like the disadvantage that some of that causes and then when you wear medium armor you can add three rather than two to your AC if your dexterity is 16 or higher, blah, 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 blah. Basically, it, it gives you one more bump to that. For a lot of dex-based characters, light armors are going to work better anyways, but this gets you a little bit more flavor. Plus, if you are a guy walking around in medium armor and, and your DM has the old school mentality, medium and excuse me, heavy armor people are looked more upon as regular warriors, regular people. It depends on your campaign, but you can use this a million different ways. Mobile is another one I would love to restrict. I think it needs to be nerfed, uh, but it's not bad, and it's a lot of fun. It is frustrating for DMs, GMs, but I see the idea behind it and why it's fun. Increasing speed anytime that you can do that, it's good. When you dash... Difficult terrain doesn't cost you extra movement. I want to read that again because a lot of people think that it just takes away the difficult terrain. It doesn't. But when you dash, it doesn't. It's specific. When you use the dash action, difficult terrain does not cost you extra movement on that turn. <laughs> Mobile monk is the best. Uh, yeah, monks in general are the best, but that's a whole nother thing, right? When you make a melee attack against a creature, you don't provoke opportunity from that creature for the rest of the turn, whether you hit or not. This is very specific. If I'm trying to get away from a big bad, I'm too close. I need to back off. Mobile allows me to go ahead and make an attack on that guy, and as long as I didn't hit, my attack made him pause for a second, made him do something, and now I can get out of there. That's what this is. Role play this if you take it. I encourage it highly. Not a big fan of mobile, but I do understand why some people want to take it. If you're min maxing, this is the one you want. But if you're not, you please use it as story element. These are amazing little story elements that you can do. And but you talk about this attack that you did that throws your opponent off just a little bit so that you can get out of there. Sounds cooler than, well, I attack, so I get to get out of there. And makes your character, like, what's the words I'm looking for? Like, that much more storytelling epic kind of thing for the bards that aren't spellcasters in your D&D campaign. <laughs> Moderately armor, we talked about. Uh, again, it's one of those, it's strength or dex that goes up, but proficient in medium armor. And you get shields with that one. Mounted Combatant. Let's talk about it. There used to be this old class called Cavalier. If you remember the old Dungeons & Dragons cartoon, Cavalier was the guy with the shield. This is a real class in D&D forever. It was part of the Knight class, I believe. Um, but basically, when you're mounted, there's usually little restrictions to it. I know, mounted is so cool. This allows you to have advantage on melee attacks. Think, uh, what is it, the in the 
Game of Thrones Dothraki. You know, coming awesome horsemen. It's great. It's back in Xanathar's. Yes, but this is, again, I'm running working out of the player's handbook right now. I just want to be clear. I will talk about Xanathar's later. But right now, I just want to talk about the player's handbook version of this. Mounted combat is just amazing. And the one in Xanathar's is not the old Cavalier. So we'll talk about that when we get there. You can force an attack targeted at your mount to target you instead. When you're riding a horse into battle, you can target the horse. It's a terrible thing. I don't like it in my games. Leave the animals alone. They didn't do anything. But you can cause it to attack you instead. And in most cases, you have a higher armor class than your mount. And if your mount is subject to an effect that allows it to make a dexterity saving throw to only take half damage and instead takes no damage, you just give your mount evasion, which is great no matter what you have evasion for, whether you're a rogue, a monk, or now your horse or your mount. This isn't just horse, and I was just trying to trying to say that. Understand that you play different characters. They can ride different things. I have heard of halflings riding wolves or goblins riding wolves now that goblinoids are a player class if your dm allows it it's a lot of fun and yeah half orc fighter with an elephant mount would be amazing but we could talk about that again uh we're gonna come into observant we've talked about it before because i took it with the guy uh my bard that i built at the beginning in in one and two but he took observant intelligence or wisdom go up by one fine pick which one am i book smart or street smart remember that's what that is if i could see a creature's mouth i can read its lips dms just because they could see the creature doesn't mean they can see the creature's mouth okay I, let, let me stop here because this came up recently in another conversation i kind of want to talk about it according to the rules of dungeons and dragons straight out of the book facing is not a thing it, it doesn't exist but there is a variant rule in the DMG about facing. I encourage you not to be that lazy of a DM. Be lazy in different aspects. But allow facing. Whatever you do to make that work, use the variant rule about flanking. That's fine to give advantage because you're fighting two people and there's a facing problem. Even if it makes it a little bit more difficult on you, tables are be very clear if i could do if you could do it to my guy i my bad guys can do it to you but use the environment if they move around they only get part of it and trust me your role playing in your games your players in general will be more reactive and will play the game more if they only have partial information instead of all the information it's a lot of fun um, and then we talk about the passive perception and an investigation. Want to hit on this again. I said it in the character build. I'll say it again. Anything can be passive as long as it's something that you actively do. Can you have a passive survival? Absolutely. If you're walking through the forest, it's fine to ask everybody what their survival is. I would, me personally, they'd have to be trained in it to be proficient in it or to, to have a, a passive in it. Just use your brain a little bit. Have some fun. Do something different. Don't be the same. Hey, y'all met in a tavern. How much time? Uh, let's hit another one here. We got pole arm master. Why pole arms, Doc? Because reach weapons are cool, yo. All right. So, when you take the attack action and attack with only a glaive, halberd, or quarterstaff, you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of said weapon. This attack uses the same ability modifier as the primary attack. The weapon's damage die for this is 1d4, and it's bludgeoning. Polearm Hexblade is, yeah, no joke. This one's more concentrated not on the reach and when i think pole arm that's what i'm thinking but it's a weapon with two ends this allows you to use the other end i've been known in the past to talk to my players who want to play a pole arm anything about that second strike without taking this uh 
my thought process if you're proficient with it you do understand that you can use the butt end of it to hit somebody um I just wanted to be clear with that. It's one of those cool things. And yes, polearm hexblade would be awesome. I think you had one, didn't you? <laughs> While you're wielding a glaive, halberd, pike, or quarterstaff, other creatures provoking a top opportunity from you when they enter the reach you have with that weapon. When they get close enough to hit them. This is an old rule. A lot of you guys remember that. If you play Pathfinder, you know this rule as well. It's not just enter leaving a threatened square. It's entering a threatened square as well. It used to be the old attack of opportunity. You still only had one, but you had to take feats for your enemies to get more, etc. I enjoy Polearm Master. Now that my brain is racking around the Polearm Hexblade, I'm loving it more. <laughs> it just sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, we'll cover one more, and that'll be Resilient. You choose one ability score, and you gain the, 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 the next effect. Remember, I just said ability score. This one's any of them. I'm going to increase that ability score by one, but I'm sacrificing one, so what do I get back in, in return? I gain proficiency in saving throws using that ability. If you're not playing a bard, this is great. If you're playing a bard, wait a couple levels. Is it bard? Somebody gets more proficiencies in saving throws. I'm not sure what it was, but all the time. I could have swore it was Bard. I don't remember. I do apologize. I don't know everything. And we'll do all the ritual casting stuff next week, but feats are fun. Use them as opportunities to roleplay your characters. Use them for your character's backstory, but... Monk is everything paladins and charisma. Is it monks? It might be monks. I think you're right. It is monks. But just as you go up, you get more. But now you have the ability to do it every four levels. Don't take something because you're trying to break the game. I want to remind you that DMs are people. They design these worlds that they homebrew or they read the games to design this atmosphere for you to have fun in. Unless your group has already talked about that the fun is going to be breaking the game and everybody, include the DM, is fine with that, I encourage you highly not to try to destroy the environment. I understand that a lot of you think it, it's funny, and sometimes it is, and I'm not saying it's not. To do something dumb that breaks it or, you know, what they break the DM is what they were saying. But I want to respect your player and your playing. I want you to respect respect the environment that I've created for you to play in as well and the things that I have. I want you to do fun things I haven't thought of to combat against. But I don't want you... Please don't seduce the, seduce the dragon in my game. See what happens. Um, <laughs> I... I'm sorry, I hate that trope. I know it's not a real thing, and I have done it with one of my characters before, but it was a story element. There was a reason for that. And it's because I knew my half-dragon son was going to be the big bad in the next campaign because the DM talked to me about it. Use this to have fun and have fun in the game. I'm not saying don't try to seduce the guard. What I'm saying is DMs be a little smarter than your players if that's what they're doing. Give them a challenge, but don't make everything a fight. Everybody needs to have fun at the table. If not everybody's having fun, then you might have to shift your game around a little bit. You have to be flexible when there's a group of people. Somebody once said D&D is really funny because it's like the nerdiest game ever where you need to have friends to play it. I always thought that was... an an incredible uh, sight. And again, when I was a kid and we played games like this and, um, and again, all the other games that were out there at the time, <clears throat> I was a jock. I had friends. I didn't get into clicks, but it was faux pas to talk about that. You play these games. It was really hard to find people who were playing the games. Now there's clubs in schools for stuff like this and other things. Cause these are amazing games and they help. Just be sure that your table is ready for it. Whatever it is you're going to do. And if you're 
character is going to do something out of the norm, don't shock people with it. Don't make it so it's weird at the table. Mention this is what my character wants to do. And then possibly proceed if you don't hit any feedback from that. But you're all playing this game. It's not just one person playing the game. There's not one hero at the table. There's three to four, and in Mike's case, 12 heroes at the table. This game should teach us something, and that's about interaction. I honestly don't care if we're going to talk about what stupid thing your character did. I want to remember that I played a game with you and I had fun. That I liked you as a player and that I enjoyed what you did with your character. Even or especially if my character didn't like your character for some reason. I want it to be one of those mutual things that we could joke about later. Not something that I walk away from the table and I don't want to talk about because it's that thing. The irony when you were a kid, nerds didn't have friends. Yeah, it was kind of the thing. Not in my school so much, but I did remember that that was uh, f some weird thing that some people had. If there's no more questions about the feats that we covered today, we're going to go ahead and we went long last time, so let's go a little short this time. Uh, for everybody who came out yesterday for episode one, recording already again, thank you. Again, this network, we're going to try to do it every Monday, but there's a schedule on the Discord. And there's a place that you can come ch chat with the cast. Would love if you just came over, inspired them, tell them what you loved about their characters, tell them what you love about the story so far. Interact would be amazing. Uh, artists are those people that need to be. <laughs> that need to be uh, encouraged all the time. Sorry, I'm laughing because somebody asked why I know how it felt. There's a reason. It's because because I thought it would be interesting. And I'll be honest with you. There were half-elves in the world until we got there we started talking about it. And I was like, no. You know what? No. Taysan is going to be the first half-elf ever. Originally in the story, it was like brand new, so there was only a few. But as I thought about it, I thought it would be way more we as in you and me were talking about how <laughs> that's true nobody did because i didn't know until i brought it up but it was fun it was a fun little thing to put in there and i've already decided what i was going to do with it it's enough talk about that come talk to these people in the chat encourage them in the chat thank you guys for coming out thank you for listening to the podcast Thank you guys for all the downloads. I think this podcast is coming close on a thousand downloads already. And I really do appreciate that. I love you all. I want you all. I forgot last night to do this. so I feel bad, but I want you all to remember to keep it nerdy and live your dreams. Later. This has been a NerdWorks production.